Hello everyone, and um, welcome to our debate today, which is in conjunction with Animal Research, uh, um, understandinganimalresearch.org.uk and idebate.org. Um, that the motion that will be a debate today is this house will ban all forms of animal research. Now, just to introduce everyone, the people for the motion is um, J um, James Bishop, who is a first year doing environmental science, um, Alistair Evanson, who is a first year doing PPE, and um, Michael Wilson, who is a second year doing politics. And then those who are um, going against the motion is uh, Jenny Lester, third year politics. Uh, Ross Stephen, a first year doing English history and teaching. Yeah, English history and teaching. And then Joseph Dean's doing uh, first year politics. Um, each each person will be speaking for five minutes. Um, and who's introducing? Who's doing the first talk? Michael, who's talking first out of this group? Myself. Myself. We're in okay. order. We're in order. Mm -hmm. And then um, and then so both of them will do a five minute introduction onto their team, and then everyone else will do five minutes. Um, so as as always, the people for the motion shall go first. So, Michael, if you could talk, please. Would you like to stand up? Ah, uh, yes, stand up, please. Stand up. Okay, cool. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I believe that all forms of animal research, etc., testing, um, should be banned. I'm against animal testing on both moral and actually scientific grounds. Morally, animal testing is extremely cruel and also completely unnecessary. Um, an example, I once, saw, I once saw some undercover footage from a laboratory in which dogs were um, force-fed weed killer to see how toxic the weed killer was. However, it had already been tested on humans and the dogs were being given 50 times what had been established as a dangerous dose for humans. What possible reason could they have for doing this? And that example occurs countless times across the whole of animal testing. It's nothing short of torture, just like pouring shampoo in an, into an animal's eyes just to see what happens, or infecting it with horrific diseases like cancer just to see if a potential cure works. I find these sorts of things utterly repugnant. Scientifically, testing products meant for humans on animals is unreliable and potentially dangerous. Animals react differently to humans um, on many, uh, to many substances, rendering many of these tests utterly pointless and absurd. For example, a contraceptive called, I think it's tamoxifen is how you pronounce it, was once developed which was tested on rats. It worked as intended and was given to humans. However, it had the opposite effect on women, which actually increased their fertility, which sort of wasn't supposed to happen. There are many other examples, some of which had much more harmful <coughs> consequences. You may remember thalidomide, a drug given to pregnant women to prevent morning sickness. It had been tested on animals and declared safe for humans, but it caused severe, de severe I can't speak, deformities in many of the babies born after their mothers had taken it. A couple of years ago, a drug called TGN1412 was tested on some human volunteers and very nearly killed them. They were on life support for some time and were left with permanent health problems. Part of, prior to being given to these people, this drug had already been tested on monkeys at a dose 500 times stronger than that which was given to the humans, without causing the monkeys any ill aspect, a, effects. Sorry. Aspen causes birth defects in cats. Penicillin causes guinea pigs, uh, kills guinea pigs, sorry. Six, ozoridine, a cancer drug which can be used in humans for long periods, will kill dogs in a few days in very small doses. The list goes on. My personal view is that products meant for humans should be tested on humans. It's the only way to work, uh, know if we, they work as intended, and we have the choice of whether or not to volunteer for testing. Animals are given no choice. They're simply used and discarded and <coughs> killed like objects. They have as much right to live as we do, and the right to live that life free of pain and misery. As Jeremy Bentham, a noted philosopher, put it, the central question is not can they reason, nor can they talk but can they suffer? And obviously they can. Our greater intelligence gives us a responsibility to protect other species, not the right to use and abuse them in a way that we see fit. That should be abhorrent to any sentient, compassionate human being. And that's why I believe animal testing should be banned. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd actually like to begin just by giving a slight sense of the scale of animal testing. The UK consumes over 300 times more fish per year than the total number of animals used in research. 
And 97% of that research is done on the least sentient animals, such as mice, rats, fish, and small birds. I would like to rebut the statement made that um, it doesn't always work on, you know, like animals and humans do have different physiologies. However, I'd argue that if we don't test it, if we test it and it kills the animals, well, <laughs> then we're proving our point. You know, if it's not safe for them, there's a high chance it's not going to be safe for humans either. If it, we don't have death or damage, we don't have proof, unfortunately. And the point made about um, human testing, you say it's voluntary. Yeah, voluntary, but let's face it. If you are in such a desperate financial situation, if you're in such a desperate situation, full stop, that you would actually go and test a drug that's going to damage or kill you, is it really voluntary or is it caused by your environment and the situations you're facing? I don't really think it is. Um, almost every Nobel laureate in physiology or medicine since 1901 has been used, has used animal research in some way or other. Um, insulin, anaesthetics, penicillin, and tetanus, blood transfusions, kidney and heart transplants, as well as replacement surgeries, were perfected off animals. Um, Herceptin, another one, is used to cure cancer, tested on animals. CT and MRI, animals. Interesting point. Many animals suffer from the same diseases as humans, such as cancers, TB, flu, and asthma. Thus, research may be beneficial for them as well. Not saying it always will be, but maybe. Um, would you, I have a question for the proposition, would you refuse drugs that have been tested on animals if you needed them? Simple question. Would you refuse to give animals drugs that were tested on humans if they needed them? Just thing to think about. Um, I'd also like to ask the, isolate, the incident you um, pointed out, where did that happen? The one with the animals being tested after humans have been tested. Where did that happen? Because in UK it's, it's illegal. Um, as is use of great apes full stop, use of lesser primates is illegal if you have tested it on anything else. If you can't, sorry, if you've, if you've not tested it on everything else and there's no suitable non animal alternative, all research needs to be approved by the Home Office. I think, honestly, it's for the greater good. And it's not nice, it's not fun, but at the end of the day, we need to test it on something, and cell research is not there yet. Right, well, um, I'm grateful for the points you raised there, um, and I'll come around to talking about some of them um, in a minute. First of all, though, I'd like to bring up um, a campaign which exists to campaign on similar lines to that that we're um, advocating today. Um, called Safer Medicines. It's a UK-based organisation that has um, as its patrons um, Caroline Lucas, MP, um, one of the better-known MPs in the House of Commons, um, Tony Benn, who's a former Minister of Technology and is also rather well-known, um, and also the actor Matt Fraser, who's a um, delivery bit in me. Um, and they have <coughs> support from a wide uh, section of the scientific community, um, and their campaign isn't based around animal ethics as such, um, because I'm quite sure that your your motives for arguing against us are not that you have no heart and you're quite willing to see animals suffer, but that you, but that you value human life um, above animal lives, and that if um, drugs can be perfected on animals um, that save human lives, then that's important. And I, I, I'm, not, I'm not going to get into a debate about whether human lives are important. What I would point out is that if we want to save human lives, Animal testing is not the way to go. Um, according to Peter, 92% of drugs that prove safe on animals uh, fail human tests, which is perhaps rather telling, because if you, that means that you've essentially got 8% of drugs that come out of animal tests are successful. Now, when we um, compare alternative methods, and at the moment there's computer simulations and um, testing on individual parts of the human body, in um, controlled situations uh, with um, stem, cell, uh, stem cell research, but also test tube um, cells. Um, it's uh, trials of new, of new drugs were carried out in Croatia um, by GlaxoSmithKline using these methods, and they had a 52% success rate when they were tested on live human 
um, subjects. That's a step up from 8% to 52% success rate. That's perhaps rather telling. Now, 52%, you might say, yes, is letter, le little better than chance. But 8%, it's pretty small. Um, and to underline this, a former um, senior vice president of GlaxoSmithKline, one of the uh, world's largest pharmaceutical companies, um, said, if we had the choice, GlaxoSmithKline would probably stop testing on animals completely. Well, maybe in a handful of cases, but certainly a massive reduction on what we do now, because it's quite simply not cost-effective and not accurate. The reason why animal testing continues in the UK is that every drug sold in the UK must be tested on animals before it goes on sale um, under a UK law from the 50s, which, as with many laws, technology has overtaken it. Um, and that leads quite nicely into your question about whether I would refuse drugs that have been tested on animals. Well, as I have had drugs before, um, have had medicines before, I, I have taken medicines which have been tested on animals. Um, and that doesn't sit well with me. And the fact that um, the, the animal testing is not scientifically necessary is perhaps rubbing salt in the wounds for those of us that object. Um, I would be interested to know how many of your Nobel laureates um, actively support animal testing, or like um, the senior vice president of GlaxoSmithKline, do it anyway, which would rather they didn't have to. Um, and on the subject of penicillin, um, because it was obviously being researched in wartime by Flory and Jay, um, uh, the initial tests, the initial serious tests when they finally produced enough penicillin to go ahead, um, was done on victims um, of, I believe, from memory, um, a dog bite, um, who it proved effective on because they had enough penicillin and a chance of treating them. And penicillin was first trialled against microbes in petri dishes rather than on animals. Um, now, you also mentioned quite close to the start of your piece about animals, certain animals being the animals used, sorry, um, let me get that right, being the least sentient. What do you mean by that? Um, what that seems to be to me is that you value the, uh, oh dear, I've got a double flat now, <laughs> um, is that you value some animals and some lives and you feel that some pain is less significant than others. Now, if we're going to start placing value on certain lives, I think you need to think very carefully about the philosophical arguments behind that. Thank you very much. I'd also like to uh, uh, just for that. Um, Mr Chair, I'd, I'd like to, if it's okay, uh, begin with some rebuttal. Um, now, I'm not a philosophy student, and I'm aware that uh, the rebuttal I'm making is to a philosophy student. Um, but you said get interested in philosophy, uh, philosophy ideas, and that, that, that's where our conflict is. And we agree it totally is, because essentially that's what's happening between the two sides in this debate. We're coming at it from a utilitarian point of view. Um, it's for the greater good, it saves more lives than it costs, and um, essentially in the long term, it has many more benefits than the short term negatives are. Um, that's essentially what we believe. We've, like, the ideas come from you tend to be quite along the canteen like, of like, preservation of like, autonomous beings we don't have the right to take away from them and all this. But um, what I'm going to try and do my rebuttal very quickly is just explain why utilitarianism is more relevant to this debate and why utilitarianism is a better basis for um, our life and especially in scientific terms, ladies and gentlemen. Because you said we were valuing lives differently. We were saying the life of an animal isn't as, poor, isn't as important as the life of a human. And ladies and gentlemen, that's not necessarily what we're saying, but we're saying the lives of a very small number of uh, animals, especially when you compare it to the other amount of animals that we kill, who've got like, food consumption and stuff um, like that, actually quite a small amount of animals, to save uh, a large amount of humans and often a large amount of animals as well. And um, we don't have a problem with that. We think that actually, in the long term, that benefits humanity, that benefits the animals, it just benefits life in general, so we have no objection to it. And yes, that is a philosophical point, but we don't see why that makes it relevant at all. Um, you know, I was talking about GlaxoSmithKline, and how GlaxoSmithKline said, we wouldn't use animal testing, and we didn't have to. Um, I'm not going to accuse GlaxoSmithKline's chairman of being a liar. I'm, it's an evil company, um, not because it does animal testing, it's an evil company for lots of different reasons. Um, including some of its animal welfare stuff, which isn't actually related to its testing. But I wouldn't put it past him to make a statement like that regarding PR when in an interview that he does, he does actually do a lot of interviews with green uh, environmental <coughs> groups, especially because they're environmental records, even worse than animal welfare records. 
um, and the animal welfare group. So actually, I'm not entirely convinced that what he said in one interview is the best way to base uh, his company's policy. Um, I'd also like to talk about, we talked about single organs and how um, we can test on single organs in our practice. And I've kind of done this once. Yeah, that's great. Um, there's actually a Scottish doctor, a good man named Dr. Lester, um, who, who does fun stem cell studies. And basically, that testing is completely irrelevant because the issue is, is that doctors can sort of guess what's going to happen to one organ. That's why they formulated it with those chemicals. That's why they've done it like that. What they're not sure of is how it's going to affect other organs. That's where the danger is. Essentially, this is more dangerous because it makes you think it's safe because it does what you wanted it to do to your heart. I mean, well, it kills your lungs or whatever, like something like that. So we're looking at actually, that's an unsafe method. Um, and so it's like totally irrelevant to this debate. So I'm going to move on to like two main points. First of all, why it's necessary, despite what the first two speakers have said on the other side. And secondly, why there is actually no viable alternative, so why we have to keep it basically. Um, so first of all, to necessity. I'm actually going to use exactly the same drug that was used by the first proposition speaker uh, to keep it nice and sim simple, but I can't pronounce its name. Uh, Flodomite, that's the one. Okay, so um, fl Flodomite was tested on animals. Um, it was then given to pregnant women and it, it basically had negative effects on them. There's, there's lots of stuff about babies that were born and about having birth defects and things like that. And yes, that's accurate. However, what's interesting is what happened after this is a group of scientists took it back to animal testing and they did the animal testing the correct way, the way that the law said they should have done it originally, but they didn't think it had been done that way. And they found that it would have failed the test, ladies and gentlemen. So actually what we find is that Thalidomide is a dangerous drug, but what happened was the company that were doing the testing were put under uh, pressure by animal rights groups to stop doing the testing, um, so it all sort of collapsed and they weren't passed properly through this test. So actually that's an example of where animal testing, if it had been done right, would have helped to save lives, would have helped to, um, like, like, wouldn't have done this damage. We actually think, if anything, it's a point for the side. Uh, so we thank you for bringing it up, although it's totally irrelevant to your case. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so like that's that's like one example of why it's necessary. But essentially, it's, it's, it's a lot of drugs like that. There's a lot of benefits to that, and it's also because um, we think in the long term it saves lives, and we are prioritising some lives over other lives. But we're not. We're doing this as a strictly numerical thing. We're totally heartless. We don't have. We don't care about how cute the cats are. We just want more cats. That's essentially what I'm trying to say. And um, so that's that's what the moral way to look at. So now on to the last one. Why there is no viable alternative? So um, stem cell research is a viable alternative. Hooray. Unfortunately, that would be me speaking in the year 2075, by which it might actually be one. Because at the moment, it simply isn't. The same Dr. Lester, who I quoted earlier, um, said that we're about 45 years away from stem cell research being a viable alternative when it comes to testing for products. But because inherently it's not, because of this problem of creating one organ and then you don't know how it's going to react to the other organs, and also because scientifically we don't know how accurate the cloning processes are, how accurate the cloning processes are. So essentially, it just doesn't work, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so what I've shown you is that animal testing is still necessary, there are no viable alternatives to it, and I've shown that, that we as a, a side in this debate are totally heartless and we're really evil, uh, but we're still philosophically right. Uh, thank you. I've been told to bring up on a couple of points, um, including <laughs> the problem with the <laughs> is actually safe in my country to what you said, and also the GS GSK um, quote we and my colleague um, mentioned before, member, colleague, whatever you wish, long person. <laughs> um, it was said to a select health health select committee at the House of Commons, not kind of representative. Right. To my argument, I've got two main problems with animal testing in general is, well, a lot of people feel, we don't feel good about it. No one likes animal testing. It's not, it's something that anyone who sees any video of even the slightest animal testing, whether it be shampoo or anything of the products that we probably have in this room, we feel uncomfortable watching. There's a big reason for that, because naturally it's not a very nice thing to see. It causes distress to the animals, more than just physical harm, depression, and mental um, problems are resulting of these tests. And this is on a massive scale, unlike what they've trivialized it as, as less when we eat fish. It's actually quite a big, quite big. 12,000 to 15,000 monkeys are imported to the US every year for animal testing alone. They're monkeys. Other non-human primates, 70,000 of which are used in the US and the EU every year. Now, in the UK, this is um, divided into three or four categories of, of use. Mild, <coughs> moderate, substantial, <coughs> and unclassified. 
And classified is when the animal dies without any, no one knowing if it, if it died from pain. Mild is mild discomfort, moderate, moderate discomfort, substantial, I don't have to go into that. 39% of testing in the UK is mild, 55% is moderate, and luckily a small percentage, but still scarily high, is 2% in the UK is substantial harm to animals. Uh, it's quite a scary thought when I don't particularly see him as a, as a philosopher or anyone who has any information about this. I don't profess to have any kind of degree in the matter, but I see an intrinsic value of life, no matter what it is. It's not because I'm a hippie, it's not because of anything else, it's because anyone who's ever seen an animal, whatever animal, no matter how sentient it is, can feel pain, can feel some degree of emotion. I don't know, not even the best scientists in the world who have studied it for over decades of their lives know how much of an old dog can feel pain. No one can say that their lives are less important than ours. No one will ever come to the fact saying these people are not, these animals, sorry, that's a bit of a slip, but anyway. <coughs> these animals are less important or <coughs> they do not suffer. And if they state that, they're lying a little bit. Even if in the best countries in the world with the rules to supervise animal testing, it still goes wrong regularly. Um, and unfortunately, animals do suffer. But my main point, I'll bring it back to science, is that, as my colleague mentioned, 9 out of 10 of the way it passes an animal times when it passes an animal um, testing <coughs> case, it actually fails next to the next few tests. It's <laughs> <laughs> okay. It fails future further tests. Nine out of ten, or as my colleague said, eight percent pass. That's quite a lot. And uh, unlike what they claim, there are quite a lot of alternatives. In, in vitro test tube methods, computerized virtual simulations, stem cell, genetic testing methods, non-invasive imaging techniques, which are very advanced, and I'm not, no one can deny that, and we can use all these, as well as microdosing, to find out the, the more accurate, reliable, to far data, greater degree of percentage and accuracy than animal testing. First of all, Mr. Chair, I'd like to thank you for being so accurate in your chairing of me. Secondly, I would like to thank the previous speaker because I really, I mean, that was just touching. Um, I feel so much compassion for these animals that are in so much pain. I mean, you might have changed my mind. Except, no. Okay, cuteness. Cuteness, like little cute kittens. Oh, so adorable. Cancer isn't pretty. Cancer is not pretty, and neither is dying from cancer, okay? And that is what we're arguing for. We are the, not only the side of philosophy, as my teammate has shown, we are also the side of science. You've, me you've t told me that we can't measure the pain of those animals, and that's why we can't hurt them. Except you just gave me statistics telling me how much pain they're in when they die. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, anyway. Uh, uh, <clears throat> where's my next point? Yeah. Uh, you told me thalidomide was only tested in mice and it's safe in mice. It was safe in mice. Then they went back and tested on primates. It wasn't safe in primates. If there had been more animal testing, thalidomide would never have gone to market. There would never have been thousands of children born in extreme pain who would be extreme pain for the rest of life because of the deformities caused. I'm getting there, sorry. My notes are a bit of a mess. <clears throat> you told me that animals react differently to humans and that's why... It's not acceptable to test things on them. They do react slightly differently, they do. That's why we test on lots of different animals. For example, chickens have the same eye codes as us. So when you research about eyes, you use chickens. If you want to research kidneys, you use mice, because that's the closest we are to them. It's all about science, ladies and gentlemen. Although they're trying to win you over by this cuteness and by saying that their methods are more scientific, I, I tell you that if they are more scientific, why aren't we using them? That's what I would say, basically. We're not using them because they are 45 years away from being an adequate replacement. Um, yeah, so back to the cuteness. 
That's my main argument. I have a big problem with people trying to win an argument because something's cute, right? What isn't cute is children dying. What isn't cute is your granddad, right? It's not cute. It's not cute, right? So what I would ask you is, would you kill and torture a little kitten if it would cure cancer, right? Just think about that. Would you, would you do it personally? If no, then I applaud you. You have insane moral standards and you can write, you can be the next moral absolutist. Like, write a book, you can come lecture at the uni, great. However, you have just, like, cost quite a few people their lives. If you'd say yes to killing this one kitten, then you've lost your moral high ground. Your argument is just about numbers. Um, and if you want some numbers, I'll give you some. Every year, 7.6 million people die of cancer. Every and in the past 40 years, cancer survival rates have doubled, and this is mainly due to drugs that have been brought into the market. And these drugs, <coughs> as you've already told us, have all been tested on animals, which makes them more safe for human consumption. So here's your reality check. There is evil in the world, right? And we're adding a little to it. We don't try and stray, 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 blah, blah, stray away from this. Animal testing is horrible and cruel, and yeah, it's not great. But what's more evil is people dying, and yeah, I'm going to do that. People's lives are more important than animals. And if you want to tell me different, then go for it. But I think you've lost the debate on science, philosophy, and facts. <laughs> May I thank all six, <laughs> all six of, um, of of the speakers here for coming and doing this. And um, now I'm going to open this up to the floor um, for any questions you would like to have. Um, I have. A member, oh, by the way, remember speak loudly just in case the computer doesn't awesome. pick you up. Um, I have a point and question. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I I'm very pro animal testing, but I have to correct something you said. Um, organ transplant surgery was not perfect on animals. Heartbreakingly, it was perfected on Jewish twins in Auschwitz by Mengele. My no question mistake. to you, no apologies, um, <coughs> if you plan on banning all forms of animal testing, how do you plan on developing drugs for animals themselves? Um, for example, <coughs> any illness in dogs would presumably have to be tested, the drugs for this would have to be tested on dogs. If you plan on banning all forms of animal research, are you just going to sort of hope for the best? Well... Usually the same way as you would do for humans, so test it, give your alternatives, and then apply it where it is necessary. What alternatives you apply... are you promoting if you're banning animal research? So you're going to try out <coughs> dog medicine on humans? No. Okay, the what's World's, your alternative then? Both the World Health Organization and the Research for Defence Studies, which um, is the organization that defends vivisection, agree that there are 450 different replacements to animal testing that can be used for both humans and animals. I'm just going to point out that there was a process where you have to like test test on all like the computer generated stuff, and then you actually have to test it. You can't you can't put it on the computer generated everything, and then just say, oh yeah, it'll probably work. Let's put it on humans. You actually have to. At the moment, you say there's this process. There's not this process. At the moment, the only legal requirement for te uh, for testing of drugs is on animals. Now, what we'd like to see is that process instituted pretty much as you say, where it first goes through computer trials, um, which GlaxoSmithKline support doing, um, and then onto uh, individual cells, and then um, grown organs. Now, what um, I would point out is that the National Institute for Clini Clinical Excellence um, approves what we're doing, um, and gave its um, approval to that in 2011. So this um, process you're describing, animal testing, is not necessary and doesn't have to form part of that process. You do have to test it, but this next step of microdosing, um, it's like you said with um, the penicillin, if that being tested on animals in the way that um, um, friends on the other side are proposing, uh, still don't know what to call them, <laughs> um, then we wouldn't have penicillin. Uh, can so, I come back to that, actually? Yeah, uh, the only place uh, penicillin is toxic is to guinea pigs, and that's at a 500 times dose of what you'd have to have to give to a human. Okay, so um, you're wrong again. Just watch, <laughs> to your question. I'd like to ask, would you take medication if it hadn't been tested on anything? We're not proposing no, not no. testing it on anything. What we're proposing <coughs> is just taking out the animal so testing. Yes, it's 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 but there are other methods to find out if it works so what, on thing. humans. And then it gets to a point in all medicine where it's animal tested or not worked, clinically tried on humans long before it's going to be given to you to see if it saves your life from cancer or whatever. Well, and these other methods happens. are much more successful, as we said, with the 52% to 38% increment. Okay, can we get your question? Well, here's the interesting thing about your glowed organs thing, right? 
we test them on animals, and as you say, sometimes, even though the animal is similar enough, it doesn't interact with, with humans. Often, we don't know why, and that's the problem with organs. We still do not understand how the human body works. We still don't understand how every little thing, every little in enzyme interacts. You can't test it on the lungs and then the heart and say, well, it did the heart, but it did melt the lungs a bit, so we won't use that. that uh, there's no substitute for a complete human body. Yes. It is too complicated. We point. agree, and an animal is not that substitute. No, no, so it's, it's a, be it's it's a, a better, it's a better a model of how everything interacts. It's a better model of how everything interacts than a thing. Like, I'm coming from... Yeah. Another I'm coming drug. from scientists. Point, point. Another drug I'm coming from, from I could say, Dr. Pettit, uh, recently, Dr. Sarkas. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. Um, you can't test psychiatric drugs well, on cells, obviously, drugs. because do a, does a cell get depressed? No. In order to test psychiatric drugs, you've got to have tested it on an organism. Well, to come back to your point there, you're saying, uh, well, we're not talking about whether testing whether this thing does what it says in the tape. The major issue is testing for side effects. Because thalidomide, what they weren't testing is whether it relieved morning sickness on the, on the mice. They were testing for side effects, and it didn't show any. Can so I, that's what we're talking about testing for. Can I ask, when you're talking about um, the testing of side effects, with uh, uh, particularly the types of stem cell research that you're talking about has been a valid replacement for uh, animal testing, um, essentially a lot of it's totally irrelevant, because actually the vast majority of drugs um, that have a, a medical side effect uh, have a psychiatric side effect, and it's, mm -hmm. it's actually just as dangerous as a physical side effect. There's, there's a, not enough to made of how dangerous the psychiatric element to drugs are. Now, if you're testing just the liver, or even if you're testing like, a liver which is attached to some other organs, you, you can't ever replicate complexity of a human, or even an animal brain, because animal brains are just a lot closer to a human brain, I always swore uh, a lot closer <laughs> to a human brain than, than just, just some organ sitting there, or a computer simulation could ever be. And the psychiatric effects are just as dangerous, if not in some cases even more so. So actually, like, there's no viable alternative to recreate it in the same way an animal would is, and that you can't win the debate on the basis that sometimes some side effects would be caught this way. I agree with and you. And Alistair, can Michael, you wanted to discuss something you wanted to rebuttal? Yeah, I wanted to do the bottle on the other team by the fact that they've pretty much consistently accused us of being wrong on facts and actually not employing facts at all. Whereas I'd actually assert that we have a lot more facts than you do, to be honest, and if you're going to base your entire argument on metaphor of women's English, please, then maybe you should join, as you said, this team. Um, right, let me give you some facts, okay? <clears throat> 200,000 medications have been released that have been tested on animals. The WHO, the World Her Health Organization, says that only 240 of them are actually essential and work properly. Only 2% of human illnesses um, are ever found in animals. According to a former head of <clears throat> um, development at GSK, um, all results, um, so the animal results plus human results agree only 5 to 25% of the time. 95% of the drugs tested on animals are discarded because either they're useless or they're dangerous to humans. 50 drugs tested on animals um, that cured um, cancer in animals actually caused it in humans. Doctors agree that 80 per 8 percent of experiments are misleading. Rats are pretty much always used in cancer research. The problem there is they never get catacomas, which is human cancer, um, which affects the membranes. They have sarcomas, which affects bone and connecting tissue, and therefore the results cannot compare. Results are also altered, uh, altered by bedding and diets. Um, correlates to 90% of the results. Sex differences cause contradictory results in that for cancer testing. That does not correspond to humans. Most medical experts say that data cannot be extrapolated okay, safely. Lemon juice is deadly poison in animals. However, Michael, let's Michael. say arsenic, hemlock and bacillin are safe. And 88% of stillbirths are caused by drugs from animal testing from a study in Germany, I'll, you can check that one out, and 61% um, of birth defects are caused by these safe drugs, and by the way, there's been a 200% increase in birth defects since drugs actually started testing on animals. Uh, um, 
<laughs> I don't, I'll agree with you, I do not have that many statistics. In fact, I have none because I was smart and didn't do any research. Honest, I'm a really clever guy. Uh, no, uh, I'm a total idiot because I didn't do any research. But here's and here's what I'm going to do. Here's, no, yeah. no, no, may I, may I, what I'll do instead is I'll use, I'll use one of your statistics there. So um, was it, I believe it was 220 or 240, I can't remember. The ones that the World Health Organization had said had made a significant difference. Um, okay, now. That doesn't sound like a lot because it's, it's a small number, it's only in the hundreds compared to the, the, the countless millions of animals that have died. But it's unfair to say that those drugs haven't made a significant impact because we believe that the impact that those drugs, the ones that have made a significant difference, the ones that have saved like hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of lives, believe that they're the drugs that are important, they're the drugs that have resulted in animal testing. You said so, it was literally your words in the hint. There haven't been that many of them, but the ones that have have been important. The 240 of those have been really important. Um, so I actually think that, like, yes, animal testing, not everyone passes. That's sort of a good thing because some have to fail because they're dangerous. Um, that's like the point of it. But we think that those that pass can make a significant difference can have a major impact, can save lives, and that's why we will like oppose this motion. That's yeah, uh, all of these two hundred thousand the medications passed animal Michael. testing, and they were Michael. still used. Michael. Would you rather that just because the two hundred forty are essential that we should still Michael. do two hundred thousand? That's <laughs> incredibly <laughs> inaccurate. Can you, you want to answer a question? Sure, uh, I have a question for the uh, for the opposition. Could you explain to me again why one life of an animal is less worth than a thousand lives? Because that's the oldest question in the world, right? Would you rather save one person and stop a train because of that, or would you would you kill the person and let the train um, kill itself? And the other question is. Um, you have never addressed the moral issues. You always talked about the scientific evidence, but what these guys actually said is that there is a problem within the moral issues, that you have to consider also animals who receive pain, animals who actually feel something, and that how could your, could your measurements actually be something good? How can anything be <coughs> good out of it if you produce it by torturing lives? That's okay, what uh, can I just reply to that? Sure. Um, you said I didn't address the philosophy behind it, but my whole speech was basically saying that if you are an absolutist, I don't agree. No, your whole speech was, I have to disagree, your whole speech was about the point that if these guys think that one life is, less, is more worth than a thousand lives, then they are on, not, they lost their more high ground. That's no, what that's you basically what I said. said. I said, said no, I said. <laughs> that's exactly what you said. I, don't I said, know if what it was exactly answer, answer. Answer. I said, if you would um, not kill one person to save a thousand lives, then you should write the next moral absolutist book because that's fantastic. However, I have to disagree with you because I fundamentally disagree that one life is more important but than why? a thousand. But why? Why? Because I'm not an absolutist, I'm a consequentialist. <laughs> we just disagree <laughs> philosophically. I think that's but, the one. Wait, okay, <laughs> this, this, this comes down to that <laughs> video question that a lot of people use for the term in cantina and utilitarianism. Well, I was talking, the one at the train, the one that you mentioned. Yeah. But, but if you, you can change the train track that kills one person or you leave it, you don't do an action that kills everyone on the train or that okay, kills a lot of people. Yeah, it depends yeah. how you ask. Like, Playing back yeah, the animals, by the way. That's, that's, yeah, I will. Like, that's that's good. Right, the simple answer to that is, um, and when I did that that test, I would have killed one person. I'm evil like that, okay, let's deal with it. Other side are essentially evil, but we're evil for the greater good. We're like the bad guy in the Deathly Hallows, okay? Mm -hmm. right? I can only reference Harry Potter. Um, yeah, the point is... The point, Sorry, the Nazi scientists were okay as well. No, the, 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 point, the point of this is that if you kill... You, if you kill one person to save a thousand, that is for the greater value of human life, but also it's for the greater value of autonomy. Because the argument that made, that's made by Kant, uh, Kant by uh, people at school... No, I'm going to get yes. just... No, 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 you keep on bringing up utilitarianism. No, Michael, Michael, Michael. Where, where 95% of drugs are discarded because they're dangerous to humans right, yeah, or unessential. Right, how is that utilitarian? Michael, I need order. Right. You, you keep saying that we've made this argument that um, a thousand animal lives are worth more than the human life. Um, I challenge you to point out the one time that any of us said that because we didn't. You can change uh, We specifically well. avoided <laughs> do, making that argument. Now, the other thing that you said is um, would, we, uh, would you kill one kitten horribly, torture one, or is it torture one kitten in order to cure cancer? Well, perhaps, yes, except. Thousands of kittens have been tortured, and where's the cure for cancer? But survival rates have yeah. doubled in the last 40 years. Doubled. Do you know what that means? It means Except twice that's not as due many people are surviving. Okay, that, 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 that. research that's not animal life. Quite the difference okay. between research and testing that you are not making. Alistair. Okay, Beth, you can go. Do you have? Well, do you? You and then is there one more question? Anyone starts? Okay, we'll just do no, two. I can. Yeah. I can. So. Um, just, uh, so um, you brought up earlier being able to um, test some drugs on organs. 
Um, and I was just wondering, we've obviously had it explained that um, stem cell research isn't quite at the stage where we can create organs. So where are you getting these from? Are you planning to take them out of the organ donation system and risk lives of people that will actually? And we need organs for the people that need them. Yeah. I like that question. Um, a few cards, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I should be calm then. Um, <laughs> if you could just... <laughs> No. Um, now, at the moment, we're at the stage um, where you, the organs that you're talking about, um, in terms of going hearts, um, we're not at the stage now where we've got fully functioning human hearts um, independent of the rest of the body. Um, and I'll completely agree with you there. Um, and this obviously is an area of science that we're doing, but we're talking about banging animal testing now, so you do have a very valid point. Um, however, we have managed to grow um, human tissues um, incredibly successfully. And what the, the argument that we're making, which is backed up by um, research biologists in numerous universities um, across the world, is that testing it on various different kinds of testing medicines on various different kinds of human tissues um, in isolation, even not as an organism. Obviously, in isolation isn't as good as an organism, organism but not at the stage of the organism yet. Even testing it in isolation is better and more accurate more of the time than animal testing. And I refer you back to the statistic where when they did it, uh, trials on uh, human tissues, 52% success relative to 8% okay. on animals. Josh? Yeah. I'm going to have to go back to that statistic that you pushed when you were saying the facts. You haven't given me a control there. I think that's... Like, you're saying that all these... Only a few of the drugs succeed, right? That, that's fine. Do only, I think only a few of the drugs will succeed with any test. That's how it tends to work. Some don't, some do. The ones that succeed, well, the ones that succeed, they succeed. That's good. But not everything's going to succeed. Animal testing is one of the many hoops that you jump to to make to refine it. And I think you'll be a bit dishonest there. Like, to add to that as well, if, if, right. if something fails in animal testing, can, can we have a bottle of hoops? Can I, can I, can I make, He's asking us not to. Oh, Michael! <laughs> For instance, computer testing After has 58%. <laughs> Um, success rate in finding out whether it, this works. Which is a remarkably low rate. number, unfortunately, and, we, and okay. every science will, will increase that number. Animal testing is less than 10%, and in fact, you have a better chance of finding out whether a drug works on, an animal, on a human body than flipping a coin. So, why can't we put them together? Why can't we use both animal and computer testing? Oh, get, no, the which is what we do at the moment. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Except many scientists mm -hmm. don't want to use animal testing because it's unnecessary and unreliable. Okay, last Can question from, from you and then we'll be finished. Okay, cool. um, I don't think you're being intellectually honest with your word, where you hold your morals, right? So I'd like, I'd like, to, I'd like to test this. And it was, it was pointed out by the audience that the uh, heart transplant, you can, was uh, was successfully done in Auschwitz, right? Now it's clearly a that's clearly a positive thing that we have we now have successful heart transplants. Wait, that's a victory. Be careful where you go with <laughs> this. No, there was always these. There was sign. There was. This is going to be. A, you're all going to hate this, but there was scientific progress made in Nazi times. Right? Oh, Nazi oh, no, 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 Right. So, would you have changed the fact that we would you would you have said we don't want heart transplants because of where they came from? We don't want this progress because of where they came we're from. We're not we're not rejecting the progress. What we're doing is saying that when we move on and we do and we advance uh, medical science in future, we need to do it in a better way. Animal testing has been used for millennia, but really only came into its own in the 50s. When at that point, it was the very height of um, our basically scientific knowledge, and it was the best way. To test new medicines. <coughs> now, in 60 years, we've gone further. And what we're saying is that we should not be stuck with a 1950s technological and scientific mindset. We have better the... options now and we should use okay, them. Okay, use the last word and then we can do it. Okay, I mean, like, it's true. There are great things you do before you test on animals. You run computer simulations, you do, you grow um, cells, you grow something like that, <coughs> some organs to test things on. We completely, agree. we completely agree. However, 
they cannot replace animal testing for another 50 years, which is what we have been saying this whole debate. Animal testing is wrong. Okay, okay. So I would like to... Can we we give a big round of applause for everyone who's doing it? Okay, I'm going to turn it off now. Okay. Say goodbye to YouTube. Bye, YouTube. Good luck.